Now, Kevin, um, one of the things, and, and it's been brought up a couple of times, but let me, let me just ask you a little bit more detail about this. Um, we, um, we, we, we look at these deeper responses, the deepest, the MR 4.5s, for example, um, in, in terms of treatment discontinuation. We're starting to talk about this issue of treatment discontinuation. So, so the question is, when should we consider treatment discontinuation? Under what conditions? Is it something that you just do on patients, or is it on clinical trial? Uh, what can you tell us about this? Well, yeah, it's a fascinating concept that maybe we can take these patients off treatment. I think it's going to become increasingly relevant as these patients get older and they develop more comorbidities. And we are starting to see more of a cardiovascular signal with some of these agents, particularly the second generation TKIs that might lead to more risks as the patients age. So I think uh, at the moment, it's certainly only in the context of a clinical trial where I would personally consider taking a patient off treatment. I know some people are doing it off, out of the context of a clinical trial. The only time that I would really consider patient uh, discontinuation is, as we mentioned earlier, uh, somebody who wants to become pregnant. Um, in that situation, you would like to see a complete molecular response that's sustained preferably over a two-year period before you would start uh, discontinuation. And I think a lot of the trials have followed those guidelines as well. Um, once you take the patient off treatment, they need to be monitored very carefully because they can relapse and they can relapse with blast crisis. They can relapse even late, late after discontinuation with lymphoid blast crisis. So you have to watch those patients actually even more carefully than the patients who are on treatment. And usually the recommendations will be to check the BCR able at least every month uh, for the first few years until you, the, the, those patients are stable. But they cannot be lost to follow up because they can relapse with blast crisis and that can be devastating for the patient. Yeah, absolutely. I think that your point about, well, you, you made some very good points. One is that doing a clinical trials right now, I think that should, 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 should still be the standard because we still have many questions that we haven't answered, you know, how deep the response should be, how, how sustained should it be before we attempt this continuation, uh, when should we restart treatment when, they, when it starts going back up, uh, all these things. So, I mean, this, uh, that is very important. And the other thing is that the very close monitoring that that requires yeah. once you stop therapy, which is even more frequent than when we're get doing the treatment. I mean, the way I tell my patients is you're getting rid of your drug, you're not getting rid of me, because I'm going <laughs> to need to be doing your PCR a yeah. lot more than, than I'm doing it now. Um, and and in, in terms of this restart of treatment, just briefly, I, I want to ask David, um, we started by restarting treatment when they became from undetectable to detectable, and now there's uh, some studies, and, and this is on studies, uh, where we let them go until they lose a major molecular response right. before we restart. Right. Uh, the studies are being done so that we can understand what is the right time. But what's your, what's your feel on, on uh, your, your gut feeling as to what would be more appropriate just when they start going up, when they get to all the way to major molecular response? Uh, mm -hmm. What do you think? Yeah, so, you know, looking at the other way around, when I'm uh, starting treatment and looking for the, the, the uh, milestones, I want to get patients to below MMR level. And I'm comfortable with that. I don't need to get them to MR4, MR4.5. And I recognize there'll be some fluctuation. But as long as they're below MMR, I, I feel comfortable. And so on the flip side, if they've uh, been undetectable, have discontinued treatment, and now they've become detectable at that range, I'm not going to be so worried. Uh, if it's stable, fluctuating at that kind of low level between MR, MMR and, and MR4.5. But I, I think what I've seen so far with, with some of the um, studies that have been done and the studies that are on, ongoing, uh, patients who uh, break through from being undetectable tend to do it fairly early, within the first six to 12 months after stopping. And I believe tend to do it at a fairly brisk rate of, of rise. And in other words, that they're going to reach MMR and above fairly uh, quickly. Uh, and I, 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 may, I may be overstating it, but I, I think uh, most of them if they're losing the response, tend to lose it all the way up, up, up there. I, it's completely, I completely agree. I mean, most of the data that has been shown, like an, almost 90% of the patient will, if they're going to lose the response, it's going to happen in the first six months. However, I want to emphasize one, what Jorge would say, that well, in the past we used to say in this editorial of Rick Lar uh, Larson, he say, TKI discontinuation, don't try at home. So I think we, <laughs> we need to still want to, to emphasize that it's something that has to be done 
in, uh, in, in clinical trials and there are very, very good monitoring. I think after so many years really emphasizing the adherence mm -hmm. and asking patients to take the drug, we cannot really let this happen in a, in a really outside these, these settings because it may be, as, as Kevin said, quite quite devastating if we have those, those breakthroughs through, through progress. Well, I'd like process. to challenge the panel. <laughs> oh, please. <laughs> please, what, Harry, you oh, always do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because it begs the question, really, I understand there's still very important research questions, but we do have the STEM trial. And we know that patients who've been on imatinib for a very long time and in a complete molecular remission in, in good labs for a couple of years, 60% of them will relapse at a molecular level but as you said, very quickly, all of them regained their responses. And then there are these other patients, about 40%, who continue in a uh, complete molecular emission or blip up, as we say, and then go back down. So, so for me, we already have 100 patients or more in that one trial, and we have five years of follow-up now. What, do, what are we waiting for? I mean, so a patient comes to your office and says, I'm sorry, the quality of my life has just not been the same on an able TKI, and you've done everything you can to get rid of maybe the fatigue or the aches and pains, and it doesn't work. I mean, is it reasonable to stop therapy? And, and I agree, it's not ready for prime time. If you're going to do this, you need to monitor them very closely. But I'd like to present like a, a one scenario that I've done recently, okay? Right. And see, what, see, see if, if you agree or not. So a woman who's been on imatinib for 10 years in a complete molecular remission for the last five years, and she has a very unusual toxicity that um, her skin turned blue. And I'm assuming it's from the drug, she's not on anything else, and we've checked uh, you know, silver levels or whatever you check, and, and you know, nothing. So um, I gave her options, and I said, we can go down on the dose of imatinib, but if you are a little less blue, would you be happy? Or, and what dose would you need? And at what dose would you not be controlling the disease anymore? We could switch you to another ABLE TKI, and I'm not, if it's C-Kit that's causing this, maybe it'll cause the same thing, maybe it won't in you. Um, or we could stop and see what happens. And when it goes back up, then we could switch to something else or use a lower dose. At least then, I can monitor for your response. If I just switch you now, you're in a complete molecular remission, so I don't even know if you need that drug. So I've offered those options to the patient. The patient chose a treatment-free remission. It's been over a year. Her uh, hyperpigmentation has abated all bounce back to normal, and her, she's in a complete molecular remission with monthly checking yeah. of PCR. So, so I, I have to really say that, and I'm gonna go after this, this wonderful case. That, that that's fine, and I don't have no problem for you or any of us to do that, but I think the problem is that, as we very well know, the, the monitoring in the United States is, is quite poor, right? We know that we, the, the, our patients are not getting the right monitoring. So my concern is that we really, really do this outside at a controlled setting. Yeah. People can really, as Kevin, has a bad event that we will really, really regret. So yeah. there is no doubt that these things can happen that we discuss in a setting, in a very specific setting with our patients. Well, well, keep in mind, our patients might start doing it without us That's knowing. Well, and well, so it's better for us to know and monitor absolutely. them closely. Yeah. But I agree with you. No, absolutely. This is not something absolutely. that we should be recommending. And, and that, absolutely. Uh, we, before we move on to the next topic, I, I do want to emphasize a couple of things. And, and it's pretty much been said by Javier. But I think it is important to emphasize uh, a couple of these points. Number one is that the STEAM trial had very specific criteria for consideration of treatment discontinuation. They used a PCR with five log sensitivity, sustained for at least two years. They restarted treatment when the PCR became positive. In that study, that's what they did. Um, and under those circumstances, we know what happens. The other thing that I think is that we need to be aware that the follow-up of five years, it's long, but probably not long enough. There's, for example, after transplant, occasional, but some 10%. relapses that happen 10%. much mm -hmm. later. Mm -hmm. So, so you know, all these things need to be taken into consideration that it's under those circumstances. And the other important thing is that we, we need to remember, you know, when we talk about the outcome on patients that are treated uh, in, in the real world is not as good, Perhaps part of the reason is because we don't do the rigorous follow-up that we do in clinical trials. And the same thing may apply in this setting. If we treat, if we discontinue outside of a clinical trial, 
therefore we do it with the same rigor as the people in France did on the STEAM trial, we are likely to get the same results. But if we do it different, if we don't right. monitor, we can transform a very good response into a disaster because we didn't Absolutely. check. And it could Absolutely. be a disaster. And, and, the, and the thing, the reason why it should not be done just routinely is what the patients I'm most concerned about are the 40% who are on unmaintained remissions. And what I'm concerned might happen is that they won't just relapse like these others did quickly, but they'll actually progress into yeah. accelerated phase of blast Absolutely. crisis. In fact, your Absolutely. colleague, Dr. Talpaz, when he was at MD Anderson doing interferon work, showed the, showed, published on a couple of it's cases sudden. just like that. That's my greatest concern. The problem I have, though, is there won't be a clinical trial that will ever satisfy us that it's safe to do from that perspective, right? Because it would have to go on for many, many years.